Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Optimize Your Storage Performance with Amazon S3. My name is Matt Sidley, and I'm joined by S3 Principal Engineer Tim Harris. We're also lucky enough to have uh, Giacomo and Derek from the Lyft Level 5 Autonomous Vehicle Team here to discuss how they achieved high scale on Amazon S3. Customers across virtually every industry and of every size, including startups, enterprises, and public sector organizations, are running almost every imaginable use case on Amazon S3. From Netflix delivering billions of hours of content to Fannie Mae processing 250,000 loan applications per day, to Major League Baseball, Advanced Media's player tracking system that uploads 17 petabytes per season onto S3 and processes. We have a diverse set of customers running very high scale on, with Amazon S3. In terms of S3 itself is very high scale. We have exabyte, customers are storing exabytes of data across millions of drives, and our index contains trillions of objects. We regularly peak at millions of requests per second and in a single region, we often process peaks of 60 terabytes per second um, on any given day. In terms of reliability, we offer a 99.9% .9 availability SLA, and oper operational performance and security are our top priorities. In terms of durability, AWS has the concept of a region which is a physical location around the world where we cluster data centers. Each, logical, each group of logical data centers is called an availability zone. We design our storage classes to spread, to resiliently store data across three availability zones and are sustained to, the, sustained to protect your data and make your data available in the event of an av entire availability zone loss. We also have a culture of durability where we do checksums and regular cyclic redundancy checks to check data corruption and repair. So the goal of our talk today is to give you a framework on how you can achieve high performance on Amazon S3 to meet your use cases. So first, I'll start off by talking about architecting to scale to high request rates with Amazon S3. Then we'll welcome the Lyft Level 5 Autonomous Vehicle Team up here to discuss how they achieved high scale on S3. I'll hand it off, we'll hand it off to Tim then to talk about optimizing for throughput on Amazon S3, achieving more predictable outlier performance, and serving distributed clients. Finally, we'll wrap it up with a summary of our best practices. So first, we're going to talk about S3 request rates and, and walk through an example. So imagine that you have an autonomous vehicle use case. Let's say you have five cars that drive around throughout the day. They characterize the environment, collect all this data, and then at night they pull into a garage and upload the data to S3. In this example, we'll say that this occurs every day, and so it's a recurring process with five cars uploading data. But before we get too much further in this example, we first need to understand how S3 request rates work and how S3 request rates scale. In the, S3 request rates start with the object naming scheme. And the anatomy of the S3 object name is made up of two components, the bucket name and the object key name. In S3, these are concatenated into a string and are one atomic unit. But it's useful to, to think about them as having a structure when designing your object key naming scheme. Taking it one step further, we can break the object key naming scheme into further components such as prefixes and the name. So here we have daily uploads, date, and car as the prefixes, and then drive data as the name of the object. It's important to note that the slash separating the prefixes and the name isn't important in any way. It's just a tool that helps us to limit and think about prefixes. The prefixes and names are not part of our read or write APIs, but they're just tools to help you think about object naming. So now that we understand the, uh, the anatomy of an object name, we can now see how this applies to scaling request rates. So your, objects, your object names in aggregate make up your object naming scheme. 
The vast majority of customers take the simplest approach to an object naming scheme with a logical object naming scheme. In a logical object naming scheme, you choose prefixes and names that fit your problem domain. So here we're talking about an autonomous vehicle example where we upload daily. So we have the days of upload and, and the car number, one through five. And, and in this example, we said we had five cars and when they pull in, they upload our rate at 3,000 puts per second and they do this in parallel. So that gives us a total throughput or TPS of 15,000 puts per second, which is pretty high scale. So in S3, we have a unit of scale called a uh, prefix. And prefixes support a set range of keys and have bounded request rates. Each prefix supports 3,500 puts or 5,500 gits. S3 identifies these prefixes as, a load, as, you, as it sees a load against these objects. But what this means is that right out of the gate, you start with high scale. Um, you might have heard that previously we had a rate limit of 200 TPS per free prefix. And while this used to be true back in 2018, we announced a 20-fold 20 20 increase to what you see today of the 3,500 puts or 5,500 gits per second. So here we have, well, as we mentioned, we have five cars that are uploading and a total of 15,000 puts per second. So initially, when they, all the uploads happen at first, we are throttled at the 3,500 puts per second. And this might look like a problem, but we'll see how this uh, automatically fixes itself um, over time. So S3 uh, recognized and identifies these prefixes as you're uploading the data and automatic, automatically split prefixes behind the scenes to create five prefixes as the workload diversified. So here, the workload was, was solved with that each car distinctly uploaded 3,000 puts per second. It split these five prefixes, identified these five prefixes, and now we have a combined rate of five prefixes at 3,500 puts per second. So now we scale to 17,500 puts per second, which is above our 15,000 put uh, per second requirement. So S3 scaled and created these and identified these prefixes to meet the needs of the application. However, here's where the object key naming scheme that we discussed earlier really comes into play. If you noticed, S3 reads from left to right when it's identifying these prefixes. And if you look closely, we first have the date and then the car name. And so what happens is we've, S3 identified these prefixes for the seventh on those car names and scaled to that meet that need. But if we increment one day, S3 hasn't identified these prefixes yet because it looked at yesterday's prefixes. So how do we fix this? By moving the cardinality or where the workload diversifies to in front of the date, this in this case the car name, we move it forward in the key name or to the, to the left, we create these prefixes just once. So on the first day on the seventh, S3 identify these prefixes along the car name. Then as we increment the date each day, those prefixes remain, have already been identified, and we automatically scale. So the key takeaway here when designing your object key naming scheme is you should think about the TPS you expect to see per prefix and design your object key naming scheme so it spreads across your prefixes, so introducing that diversity. Ideally, the date would be placed after the variable that spreads a load so, so that the date becomes a non-factor. So we often get the question for customers is, we've been talking in terms of puts and gets, but what does that mean in terms of total TPS? And request rates are allocated proportionately. So the way to think about this, if you take 50, if you have a workload that does 50% writes and 50% reads, in terms of TPS, you would take 50% of the write limit and 50% of the read limit to get your total TPS. So in this case, that would be 4,500 combined. And if you had a different application that maybe did 30% writes and 70% gets, doing the same type of math procedure, you would get 4,900 TPS combined. So the key takeaways for the request rates 
are that request rates start with the object key naming scheme. You automatically start with high request rates of 3,500 puts or 5,500 gets per prefix. And S3 automatically identifies these prefixes behind the scene under a, a sustained load. And finally, the total TPS for prefixes is proportional to the request rates. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Derek and Giacomo to talk about how Lyft Level 5 scaled their request rates. Hi everyone, my name is Derek Grella, and I'm a software engineer at Lyft Level 5, working on data infrastructure for self-driving cars. Thanks to AWS folks for having us here. I'm very excited for this talk. At Lyft, we follow a two-pillar strategy to self-driving. We have Lyft Level 5, which is our own self-driving division, where we build software, hardware, and operations for autonomous cars. We also have a second pillar, which is open platform, where we let leading, well-vetted third-party providers on our platform. For example, Aptiv here in Las Vegas. So if you open up your Lyft app, you sign up for AV rides, and you request a ride from some hotel to another hotel, if there is an AV car available and your route is within its limits, you might be able to be matched with an active car. Now going back to Lyft level five, we started in 2017. We have over 400 engineers now. My, our headquarters are in Palo Alto, but we also have offices in Munich, London, and San Francisco. Now in Palo Alto, we live a little bit in the future. We have a pilot program for our employees where they can take self-driving cars uh, around our office using their Lyft app. Now in this talk, I'll cover how we use S3 at Lyft Level 5. As we have teams who operate large-scale production workloads, and at the same time we have other teams who are more in a research mode. They operate smaller workloads, they need to iterate fast, and only select ideas get productionized. I'll talk about how we tackled scalability challenges that we have faced. I'll talk a little bit about using random keys for your prefixes in S3 and using folder-like structure for convenience. And as you might have already noticed, there will be a lot of emphasis on prefixes because prefixes determine performance. So as our cars come back from missions, we take a data disk out of the car and we pull it into our upload hardware. Now we use then direct connect to upload it to S3 and we then consume SQS notifications in our cloud jobs to process the data, extract some metadata. We save that metadata to DynamoDB and then we propagate it to Elasticsearch. Now Elasticsearch is great because it lets us query very flexibly by any field or time range. This is what we started with in 2017. Our S3 folder structure was very flat. All the data was in one bucket. Keys were pretty random. So we would take MD5 of file contents, compute it, and use it as the file name. So as you can see, files that are next to each other can come from very different dates or cars. Now this is great for scalability because everything is pretty random. The prefixes are rather random. So all the partitions that get created scale well for our workload. So we've been using this until this year for two years, pretty much with no issues. Now the challenges that we faced recently, three challenges. First one was backfills. For us, backfills means ingesting months or years of data within a very short period of time. Hours or days. At one time, we scaled up all the way to 8,000 workers to process data 
and then we hit different errors. We went and investigated, and it turned out that DynamoDB was starting to throttle us. So we increased read capacity units, write capacity units, and then that was resolved. So the next limit that was S3 limits. And that was a surprise to us because up until that point, we've never had any issues with S3. Now, that said, it was small enough that we just scaled down a little bit and we were able to continue our backfill process. Second challenge that we faced was when we enable data retention. So in our metadata stores, we can only store data for maybe six or 12 months. And that's for various reasons. Once data is not in the index, it's very hard to locate the S3 data that we need. So we had teams that used data that was over a year old, and for them to recover it, they had to basically list through the whole bucket and then post filter, picking select keys. Now that still ended up with small data gaps as they made small mistakes. Now the third thing that we faced was Elasticsearch scalability. We started seeing issues when we had 10 billion documents in our Elasticsearch cluster. And then as we kept going, it went to 15 billion documents, 20 billion documents, and it's now at over 25 billion documents. At 20 billion documents, the situation got so bad that we started working with AWS Elasticsearch team to figure out any kind of improvements we could make. So we did make some progress. We optimized some queries, and that worked to some extent. But what we realized is that to make Elasticsearch scale would require a significant investment on our side, and it would never be truly horizontally scalable. So in parallel, we worked with AWS S3 team to make sure to see what kind of solution we can come up with just on how we store data. And we came up with this single solution that solves all the three problems that we faced. So it turns out that people, when they search for data, they usually look for a specific car, time range, or sensor, or a set of sensors. So we put all of those in the prefix. So we put date, we put car ID, and we put sensor ID in the prefix. And then we put minutes in the beginning to leverage S3 partitioning to its full extent. So the most important takeaway that I want you to take back from this is how important it is to have a static high cardinality prefix. And let me explain what I mean by that. For example, we chose minutes. Minutes are good because people are as likely to access data from minute seven as they are from minute 28. So we leverage all partitions. As our data grows and usage grows, S3 will scale up automatically for us. Having cardinality of 60 different minutes will be enough to have, I don't envision us having even 60 partitions for a very long time. Now, the third aspect of this is that the prefix is fairly static. So what we, the partitions that were created based on yesterday's data will work for tomorrow's data. If we created 10 partitions yesterday, they will work just as well tomorrow. With that, I'll hand it over to Giacomo, who joins us from Live Level 5 London. So hello everyone, I'm Giacomo from London, and in London we're doing more of a research approach to things. And what we actually do there is we build large maps, 3D maps of the world. As you can see, this is San Francisco. And what we do is we collect a lot of images, then we take all these images and we build a large map, and then we use this map to localize cars in these maps. And localizing cars gives us trajectories, and then we use these trajectories to understand how other people drive. There's an example, still in the San Francisco area. 
Now, um, given that our system changes pretty frequently, we had to adapt actually to how we use S3. Um, what we do is we collect a lot of data, different times of the day, different areas, different seasons, and we aggregate all this data in one map. All the input data lives in one bucket. You can imagine billions of keys in this one bucket. And we have our computer vision pipeline which runs on AWS Batch, which ingests all this data and then produces a final map again on S3. Now, our research team um, wants to use <laughs> S3 as if it was a file system, right? It's easy, it's convenient. And this brought us to having some very bad um, prefix, which is not exactly what I'm showing you right here, but you can imagine it's something like this. And this gives us then poor performance in our AWS batch CV pipeline. So um, we had two possible approaches, change completely our structure on S3 or try to squeeze out um, whatever performance we could get on, from S3. So we decided to first try to squeeze out all the bits from it. And to do this, we used parallel calls whenever possible. Um, this brings you pretty easily to the maximum throughput you can get. But when you start to do this, you will see that you will have some retries necessary because things start to fail. Either you get throttled or S3 itself gives you some 500 errors. And then one important thing we noticed, it's um, pretty bad to list buckets which contain a lot of keys. So if you have a certain prefix with billions of keys, it's not a good idea to list that. Um, especially in the case that you just need maybe a few specific keys. So uh, what we did there as a first solution was just to um, try to chunk the list of keys into smaller lists where we knew they had a common prefix, store a file with all the keys on S3, and whenever you need some specific key, you would download this file, locally go through the file, and pick the keys you need and just download those. And that makes a big difference. And finally, one more important thing. From the beginning, we had actually an obstruction between our code and S3 itself. And this allowed us to test also other storage solutions, EFS, FSx, and in general, this is very helpful and flexible. So with these, um, changes, let's say. We achieved a scale where we could process billions of keys. We had 100,000 calls running on batch hitting S3. And we had long computations, one and a half days on average, with millions of requests. And we started to see also 500 errors at this scale. Um, so this still didn't really, um, wasn't enough. So we had still our research team who wanted to keep the same structure, but our maps were getting bigger and bigger. So we had to address some of the performance. So the idea there was to insert between our keys, which were not in a perfect format, and actually S3, um, an additional layer where we would have a two-way hash function. You can imagine it something like a scrambling function, which though you can reverse. And this allows you to have on one side keys where you can use them as if it was a file system, but on the other side, S3 will keep scaling, as you saw before, because we will have random prefixes and all these nice things. And um, with this, I would like to uh, make you think a little bit before you start to use S3 in the sense, um, it might be that in your case, you really need more of a file system-like approach, and this doesn't mean that you will have horrible performance. I mean, hopefully it will be good enough for whatever you need. And having completely random keys, it's amazing, but you will need some kind of index or something like that. So I think it's important to think on which part of the scale do you want to be when you start to use S3. And with this, I will hand over to Tim. Thank you. My name's Tim Harris. I'm with the S3 engineering team in Cambridge, UK. And we're going to shift a little bit now and look in more detail at techniques for optimizing the bandwidth coming from S3 or the profile in terms of uh, latency and outliers on requests. Now, I'm going to be looking at the setting where we have EC2 instances accessing storage in S3 in the same region. And the kind of best practices that I'm going to talk about are the techniques that you'll see being used inside data lake query engines or inside software with latency sensitive workloads such as serving video content out of S3 into a CDN. <laughs> 
And this setting, working within a single region, is important both in terms of uh, providing good networking performance and also because there's no data bandwidth charge for the transfers in this case. So let's look first at the mental model for how to interact with S3 because this is a little bit different for many storage services, both in the cloud and on-premise. With S3, you should really think about the service as a large distributed system, and a system that exposes large numbers of endpoints that you can route your requests to. And you should take the most uh, advantage of this scale, scaling horizontally using those endpoints. So let's look at a, a, a first example case and think about downloading a large object, or sorry, downloading a, a large set of objects from a bucket in S3. And in this case, you would scale horizontally by making multiple separate connections to S3, downloading different objects over different connections, and benefiting from the scale of the service and the fact that this will help avoid any hotspots building anywhere in the system. Now, in terms of how many connections to use for these downloads, a starting point would be to think about the network throughput you're looking to achieve and the capabilities of the, the network interface on the instances that you're using. And to start out with about 100 megabytes per second uh, for each of the connections. And we have details on this on the performance optimization guide on the SV web pages. So it's worth checking in with that over time and making sure that the up-to-date guidance has been used. So at the moment, for a 10 gigabit network interface, you might use around a dozen connections transferring data from storage. For 25 gigabit network interface, you might use around 30, 32 connections. And this parallelism is great. And we have customers that can saturate the network interface even on the 100 gigabit instances that we provide. But it's worth doing some profiling first of all, making sure that it really is the network interface that needs to be uh, driven at those loads that is not, for instance, going to be local processing or whatever downstream storage the data is going into. We sometimes see workloads where there's bottlenecks elsewhere, uh, not just on the, the transfer from storage. Let's dive a bit more deeply into how to establish those parallel connections to S3. Now, you'd normally think about connecting to S3 using a, a DNS name derived from the name of the bucket. So for this AWS example bucket, you do a, a DNS lookup on that name, .s3.amazonaws.com, and get an IP address back, make a connection to that address, and make a request for the, for the key. Now, if we look in a bit more detail at what happens when doing that DNS lookup to map from the bucket endpoint name to the IP address. You'll see that the information returned by the DNS server uh, has this number five in it, just to the, the left of the highlighting box here. And what that's indicating from the DNS server is that this mapping ought only to be used for five seconds. After that time, client software ought to not be caching the mapping any longer. It ought to be going back to the DNS and making a fresh lookup. And this is the mechanism that we use to try to spread load automatically across the S3 web servers. Because each time you make a DNS lookup, as long as it's not a, a big burst all at the same time, you'll be getting a mix of these different IP addresses. And if you're doing lookups from across a large fleet, like a, an EMR Spark cluster, then each of those lookups will also be likely to see separate DNS uh, responses, separate IP addresses. So if you're tuning or developing a workload, it's worth watching out for this, making sure that DNS lookups are not being cached overly aggressively or are being reused across multiple uh, connection requests for multiple instances, because you want to try and avoid any unnecessary concentration of load anywhere in the system. One way to debug which I use when developing on Linux is to use the netstat tool with the numeric hosts option. So that provides a, a super low level way 
of looking at the active TCP connections, checking the IP address they're going to, and then lets you make sure that there's no unnecessary reuse of the, the same address. Now, I mentioned that it's good to spread the load over multiple IP addresses, but it's also good to reuse each of these connections some number of times, maybe for a dozen requests or so, or for several minutes. And the reason for doing this reuse of a connection is to avoid some of the startup effects that happen when you're doing the, the connection afresh. So being able to amortize the TCP handshake, the SSL handshake, and the time taken for TCP slow start. So you might reuse a connection for a few dozen requests. So far, I've been talking about how to handle transfers of many separate objects from a bucket. And let's look now at the related case of how to transfer a large object more quickly than over a single connection. And the way that this can be achieved is to use byte range fetches for different portions of the object and either process those byte ranges of the object in parallel client side in the way that many data lake query engines do, or to reassemble the, the pieces client side into a single object that you can stream through from the beginning. So at the HTTP level, you would see this in terms of a, a range header on the request, or if you're using the SDKs, you'd see this as a, as a set range option on classes like get object request in the C++ SDK. And as before, you can spread these requests over multiple S3 endpoints. The fact you're accessing the same object uh, does not matter here. You can be fetching byte ranges out of that same object from multiple S3 endpoints, streaming them in parallel, and reassembling them. Now, there's a common question on what is a large object? When should I start using parallelism to transfer it? And the general rule of thumb here would be to start thinking about parallelism when you get to the sizes in the tens of megabytes. So if you're uploading objects to S3, these are the same size ranges where you'll see the SDK and tools like the Transfer Manager and CLIs starting to use multi-part upload. We just start using parallel byte range fetches for download at about that same level of eight megabytes, 16 megabytes, or thereabouts. Finally, when thinking about throughput from S3, it's worth putting these ideas together with the key space issues uh, that Matt described at the beginning of the session. So if you have a workload that's downloading, scanning large numbers of objects, and you're distributing this scanning work across a cluster of EC2 instances, then we'd recommend trying to spread the load widely across the prefixes that are being accessed. So if we're scanning 1,000 objects, maybe handing off the first 100 to one of the instances, the second 100 to the next of the instances, so that there's load across the key space rather than a concentrated uh, scanning work starting at one end of the space and working uniformly through to the other. Now let's take a look at a slightly different aspect of performance now, how to think about workloads where you're designing for predictable performance over a series of requests. And the kind of example I've got in mind here is generating chunks of video from S3 to serve to customers over the internet through a CDN. So in these workloads, video may be encoded into chunks where a chunk of a few seconds of video is a byte range of a few megabytes of data from S3. And we need to serve the chunk to the client within the time scale that it represents in order to avoid any client-side stalls in playback. Now, the basic approach here when handling outliers is to start by measuring the typical performance that you see. And if you're fetching regularly sized chunks, so the same size for each of the fetches, you'd expect to see consistent performance from one fetch to the, to the next. So, for instance, if you're distributing these fetches across multiple IP addresses, as I was describing earlier, you would probably see single requests for a few megabytes taking tens of milliseconds, maybe 100 milliseconds. But as on the, the stylized figure here, you may occasionally see some outliers 
that uh, are taking longer than that, that typical case performance, maybe because there's a, a packet drop somewhere in the network that affected the, the TCP performance on the connection. So what we can do to try to mitigate the effect of those outliers is to measure the common case performance and then to identify a threshold beyond which you think a request is not performing as expected. And there's a couple of ways to identify that threshold in a quantitative fashion. So if we think about the, the video serving workload, perhaps we have a, a budget of four seconds end to end, getting the data from S3 back to the, the client through the CDN. And of that four seconds, perhaps we allocate two seconds to the CDN and two seconds to fetching the data out of S3. Now, two seconds is likely to be significantly longer than the common case performance that we're seeing for downloads of this request size. So perhaps we set a, a threshold at 1.5 seconds after which we decide that a request has not performed well. And at that 1.5 seconds level, we've still got 500 milliseconds of slack available if we make a second attempt to download that request. And that 500 milliseconds ought to be easily enough if we have this common case behavior where the downloads may be taking 100 milliseconds in the, the typical case. Now we can also look at this in terms of the percentage of requests that are exceeding the threshold and being retried. And with these numbers, it may well be we're only retrying the slowest 0.5%, 0.1% of requests because the common case behavior is significantly below this threshold we're using to identify outliers. And so what this means, putting this together, is that if you try a second time on a request that breaches the threshold, we're very unlikely to be unlucky two times over. So a single request is good enough for many of these workloads because the common case performance is seen so regularly. A few other comments to make about retries. First, it's worth using different timeouts when trying to establish a connection to S3 from the data transfer that's being made. And the details vary between the SDKs, but many of the SDKs will let you set a very aggressive timeout on TCP connection setup, and then a timeout on the data transfer that's more tailored to the size of the objects, the size of the requests that you're making. Next, after setting up any retries, it's important to rate limit them to make sure that if there is a larger number of outliers, that the system doesn't get into a state where it's continually retrying and not making progress. So for example, if you're making 1,000 TPS in the common case and you set a retry threshold based on 1%, then you might expect there to be about 10 retries per second. And so if you rate limit them with a uh, a token bucket or other mechanism to about 15 TPS retries, then that avoids the system getting into a, a, a retry storm state. When you do retry, it's worth taking uh, steps to make sure the performance of the second attempt is as independent as possible from the performance of the first attempt. So that would mean certainly using a, a fresh TCP connection to S3, but ideally also using a fresh DNS lookup if you're working at a, at a low level and can control the, the timing of those, those DNS lookups. So that helps make sure that the request is taking a different path through the network, and if there was some issue that caused a, a TCP packet loss, for example, you'd be less likely to see that a, a further time. This goes back to the overall goal of spreading requests wide, widely across the S3 endpoints. Let's just look at a, a couple of other reasons why, why you may wish to retry a request. Now, earlier in the session, Matt described how S3 will respond to sustained high load on a prefix um, in triggering the internal reorganizations there. But while that's happening, you will see the, the 503 slow down responses to HTTP requests being made. So the best way to handle these slow down responses is to identify ways in your workload to reduce the request rate. So it could be done by reducing the size of a, a cluster so you can save on compute costs while making the requests at a, at a lower rate. Or it could be by 
introducing exponential back off and some jittering there to uh, just uh, rate limit for the requests that are being made. And it's worth making sure that while uh, responding to the 503 responses, you would then uh, occasionally be probing to make sure that when the partitioning is completed, that you'll expand up and be able to benefit from the, the range of prefixes that have been identified. Finally, as the, uh, as the data from Lyft il illustrated, you may see a very small percentage of other 500 series error responses. I think the numbers just now were suggesting maybe 100 out of several hundred million uh, requests made to the service. So all of these 500 requests ought to be retried with the same kind of exponential back off and jitter and rate limiting that we would use for the, the 503 responses. And this just helps make sure that the higher level operation that the request is part of, maybe a query in a data lake or the video download, is not going to be failed if one request in a, a, a very large number uh, experiences a 500 response. Now, one final observation as I wrap up this section. I've talked about a lot of detail at a very low level, how you might do DNS lookups, how you might configure timeouts, when to use a new connection, when to use uh, an existing connection. But a lot of this are techniques that are existing in software today. So data lake query engines would be using many of these techniques. The SDKs provide assistance in implementing these techniques. And higher level abstractions that we provide, uh, such as the, the CLI tools and the transfer manager classes inside the SDK, uh, take on board these best practices in managing pools of connections and handling parallelism and requests. So at this point, I'll hand back to, to Matt, who will shift gears to the case where data is being distributed to a wider set of clients rather than the same region, EC2. Matt. Thanks, Tim. So as Tim mentioned, oftentimes you might have use cases where you need to reach uh, clients that are spread across geographies, whether that's within the country or even around the world. And so we'll, we'll take a little bit look at some of the best practices and design patterns that we see customers doing here. So the first, in serving distributed clients across a wide or in multiple geographies, customers often use S3 replication to distribute identical copies across multiple regions. S3 replication is an automatic and asynchronous process that makes identical copies of your objects and retains all the metadata. Since S3 cross-region replication launched back in 2015, customers have replicated exabytes of data to different regions. However, we heard a lot of feedback from customers that wanted more predictable replication. So just last month, we introduced a new feature called S3 replication time control. And it provides a 15-minute replication window backed by an Amazon S a AWS service level uh, agreement which says that 99.99% of your objects will be replicated in at least 15 minutes. Just to be clear though, most objects actually replicate within seconds. Additionally, with this new launch, we also offer uh, new monitoring metrics through CloudWatch that give you insights to how your data is being replicated. So getting a little bit more into these metrics, first, we provide the replication latency of your replication status. So oftentimes customers wanna know when was the last time an object was replicated or for my P100 case, how long has it taken for objects to be replicated? So with this new replication time control metric, you can see that replication latency for that P100 case. It also shows you how many bytes are pending and number of objects are pending replication. Customers are often want to look at S3 transfer acceleration um, Amazon CloudFront or AWS Direct Connect when optimizing for performance outside of, um, outside of Amazon S3 to uh, EC2. So we'll dive a little bit deeper into each of these design patterns. So first, S3 transfer acceleration, which manages easy, fast, and secure transfers of files across geographical distances. Some of the common use cases we see from customers is that they have clients that are spread out throughout the world and 
they want to upload to a single centralized bucket, maybe for, for logging purposes. And so the way Amazon uh, S3 transfer acceleration works is it goes to the closest, the request is routed over to the closest CloudFront point of presence, and then is uh, routed over an optimized network path. With it, what's one of the great things about S3 transfer acceleration is that you can look at um, what, is, what happens when the, you use S3 transfer acceleration or when you don't use S3 transfer acceleration through a browser tool that can help you make a more informed decision. So next is Amazon CloudFront, and it's a very common design pattern when, out, when accessing data outside of S3 to EC2. However, we can more generally say that caching is a very common design pattern. And when you, when you have an application that stores data in Amazon S3, but serves a working set of data that's repeatedly requested by users, then it makes sense to often cache that object. For example, if you have a workload that's sending repeated Git requests for a common set of objects, you might use Amazon CloudFront, or if it's in with an EC2, use Amazon ElastiCache, or if you have a media workload, AWS Elemental Media Store. So how does caching actually work with Amazon CloudFront? So as I mentioned before, Amazon CloudFront is a fast content delivery network, or a CDN, that transparently caches the data from Amazon S3 in a large geographical distributed set points of presence, or POPs. When objects might be accessed in multiple regions or over the internet, it often makes sense to cache the object closer to that end user. So how does it actually work? First, if you have a client, the request is routed over the op to the optimal edge location. If the object is in the cache, it's returned back to the client for that low latency. If it's not, it uses S Amazon S3 as the origin and gets the object from Amazon S3 and then puts it into the cache and then returns it to the end client. And then the next time, now that the object's in the cache, uh, the request will automatically just go to the cache and then back to the client. Another common caching pattern, if you need um, low millisecond or sub millisecond latency on requests, is to use Amazon Elastic Cache. Amazon Elastic Cache is a managed in memory cache. When, to use uh, Amazon Elastic Cache, you can provision Amazon EC2 instances that cache objects in memory. And we've seen customers have a 98% improvement in latency and in in increases in download throughput. To use Elastic Cache, you might modify your application logic to store hot, data's, hot data in the Amazon Elastic Cache, and then also send requests to Amazon S3 to retrieve objects that you need to request in the future. Finally, Amazon AWS Direct Connect is a great way to improve your performance to clients outside of an AWS region. There are several advantages. First, bandwidth is reduces your bandwidth costs. By using AWS Direct Connect, you can reduce your commitment to your internet service provider. And second, using AWS Direct Connect has lower uh, data transfer rates than going over the, the internet. Second, you get a more consistent network performance. The internet is often changing and, and routes are changing, as, as, as you know. So by using AWS Direct Connect, you get a more predictable route or consistent route for your performance. AWS Direct Connect is compatible with all database services and has private connectivity with your Amazon VPC. It's simple and elastic. You can choose one gigabit per second or 10 gigabit per second in um, Direct Connects and then scale as appropriate. So let's put this all together with a summary of our best practices of what we've talked about today. So first, as with any optimization work in general, you start with a simple version of the workload and scale and checks that that works correctly. For instance, before scaling up to run 10 threads, work with a single thread and measure how it performs. That way you can identify the bottlenecks before you increase the thread count. For example, with a single thread, if you saw that the CPU utilization was 50%, you want to no notice that before thinking about how the network scales. Monitor how performance changes 
and if resource utilization scales as you expect. Second, when thinking about your key space design topics, or a key space design topic I introduced earlier at the start of the session, you should look at your 503 responses. If you see 503 responses briefly, that's Amazon S3 identifying the prefixes behind the scene. However, however, if you continue to see those 503 responses, look at your access patterns and consider making key space design changes um, if, it, if that would help. Third, if you're focused on high throughput, then use horizontal scaling, as Tim talked about, across a pool of connections. Check that the connections are made to a diverse set of IP points, IP points and check that the operating system, and check with the operating system if possible. Fourth, if you're focused on achieving a more predictable outlier performance, then identify stragglers via thresholds such as targeting the slowest 1% of requests and retrying those requests. Finally, a lot of what we've covered today is looking at under the hood on how to optimize performance to S3 with controlling factors such as DNS lookup, TCP connection management, and retry strategies. The AWS SDK provides built-in support for many, many of these guidelines and for many workloads that provide a simpler API to use when interacting with your applications. They are regularly updated to follow the best practices and include logic like retrying on 503 apps automatically. The SDKs also provide the S3 Transfer Manager, which automatically automates horizontal scaling and making byte range requests where appropriate to achieve thousands of, re of requests per second. It's important to use the latest version of the SDKs because we're always making updates to them when we're best performance practice, best performance practice guidelines change. And with that, I want to thank you. If you want to learn more, we have um, a number of AWS training and certification classes. And on behalf of us, we want to thank you for your time today. And we ask that you please fill out the survey when you have a minute. Thank you.